Thank you, Carol, and, and nice to see everyone here. Um, I'll start by talking about the number one phrase that makes me groan. My students can't write. This slide has two illustrations of what I mean. One is a description of a concern raised at the 1962 Four Cs. The other comes from an October 2016 issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education. Clearly, the idea has legs. I'm betting we all have our own examples, too. Here's one from me. A faculty member from another department approached me at a reception with a variation on the phrase. Why can't my students write? They've taken writing courses. Their writing just needs to be clear and concise. Why can't they do that? This lament, this story that students can't write, works from the premise that writing is just writing. It's a thing that writers bang out. It's constituted of words that are clear, that mean the same thing to everyone, that are easily accessible and need only be plugged into forms. But as writing professionals, and this is the phrase I use to refer to we writing instructors, consultants, tutors, students, and administrators, we know that writing is so much more. It's a strategy that can be used for learning, a way of negotiating identities within and around specific contexts, a representation of ideas, a way of participating in ideologies, a strategy for movement. We build on these understandings as we work with writers every day in classrooms, writing centers, workplaces, community sites. We build on them as we work with faculty colleagues to use writing as a strategy for learning and exploration, even especially those who complain that students can't write. All of these uses of writing make the point. Writing is never just writing. Our research, our teaching, our discussions of what we do and why we do it are suffused with illustrations of how writing is never just writing. Here are some speedy examples, images from undergraduate and graduate students around the country. They are representations of existing concepts of writing studies or new ones or habits of mind that these writers have found especially significant. These illustrations and examples come from the places and people I know best the focus of my work, faculty colleagues, graduate students teaching first year writing, undergraduates. But the idea that writing is never just writing also matters a lot beyond the classroom. In the current political moment, writing has been implicated in efforts to make bigotry, violence, misogyny, homophobia, Islamophobia, and other forms of injustice part of what's considered normal political discourse. The examples I've just provided might not seem to be about this moment, and yet in some ways they are. They show how people have engaged with elements of the idea that writing is never just writing to dig into critical questions like the one in this slide. How does writing create perceived realities? How does the circulation of writing perpetuate and amplify these realities? How can we use writing as a strategy for growth, participation, or change? The recent election and its aftermath have continued to show us that some of what we believe about writing might not be as widely shared as we'd presumed. For example, that evidence matters for writing or that effective writing creates opportunities for reasoned discussion. These challenges are uncomfortable, even scary. We could say that they are troublesome. They contradict fundamental beliefs, challenge our understandings of how things work. They point to problematic dilemmas for writing professionals. As the chair of this organization devoted to writing and composition, I'm privileged to speak to you at the moment of these dilemmas so that we can think together about this thing, writing, that is so much more than what it seems on its surface. The remarks I'm sharing with you build on Joyce Carter's keynote address at 4Cs 2016. Joyce also focused on the current moment and outlined two modalities for grappling with it, advocacy and innovation. Joyce focused on innovation. I'll shift to advocacy. To do this, I'm going to lay out some troublesome dilemmas and then talk about how we can advocate for the idea that writing is never just writing within and among them. This will involve working from our disciplinary identity, then making connections with others. Will this be easy? Perhaps not. But as a former presidential candidate said in his first run for office, we are the ones we've been waiting for. It's time to get to work. 
I'll focus now on the dilemmas. When I talk about these, I could discuss some that emerged so starkly from the presidential campaign. What to do about the power of social media, the proliferation of fake news, the circulation of non-fact-based evidence. These are huge issues, but I'm going to keep my attention focused and follow the advice that I give to students and colleagues so often. I'm going to discuss what I know. No matter what jobs I've taken on, I'm a writing teacher. I'm also a writing researcher, a writing program administrator, and right now what I think of as an administrator beyond writing. But at the core of all these roles is that identity as a writing teacher. From here, I look at things that are sometimes considered mundane. How literacy is defined and by whom, how it's taught, how it's assessed. I look at these in conjunction with the people who matter most in my work life, college teachers and undergraduate students. This means that I ask questions about how to make a difference to conditions surrounding teaching, learning, and literacy development for these students and their teachers. I also look at public policy associated with each of these. It's from this vantage point especially that I see all matter of challenges to the idea that writing is never just writing. These stem from and loop back to a dominant story crafted and repeated by a sprawling network that I think of as the Educational Intelligence Complex, or the EIC. Like its namesake, the Military Industrial Complex, the EIC is a collection of NGOs, granting agencies, businesses, consulting firms, policy institutes, actions, and actors. The story it tells is called The Problem with American Education and How to Fix It. Elements of the story include what education is and isn't, what learning should and shouldn't be, and why. This story matters for rewriting professionals, for our students, and for what we are able to do with and around writing. The EIC's story can be traced through countless documents, policy reports, white papers, testimonials, books, news stories. It begins with the failure of the American educational system to prepare students for the world of work and it holds out the threat of economic peril as a consequence. Because students don't know the right things, it says the US economy is going to be in trouble. This story is clear in A Nation at Risk, a 1983 report published by the Education Department. It said that students aren't learning enough and what they are learning isn't what they need to. The problem is with the delivery model. Classes and curricula are too disconnected from the requirements of work and not tailored enough to the needs of individual learners. An influential 1996 report from the National Education Summit, a gathering of governors and corporate leaders, explained the implications for the economy. Corporate leaders question how much longer we can compete effectively in a global economy, it said. While these two early reports laid the blame at the door of high schools, the story quickly moved to colleges. Ready or Not, a report published in 2004 by the influential NGO Achieve, for instance, said that the American high school diploma signifies only a broken promise and built the bridge to post-secondary learning. It said that most high school students need remedial help in college, and most college students never attain a degree. The story then moves to solutions. Because teachers, schools, curricula, and systems are failing to produce students who meet the needs of the economy, those invested in the economy must step in. With their input, institutions need to educate to discrete and measurable competencies needed for workplace success, outline clearly defined pathways for measuring those competencies, identify measures by which achievement of competencies will be indicated, and use those measures and their achievement as a basis for continuous improvement. This is the story told in documents like A Test of Leadership, the report from the Spellings Commission. Since then, it's been told in so many EIC initiatives, projects, and reports that they're hard to count. You can see it in commercial grade competency-based education, in the manic drive to define and assess learning outcomes at the core of institutional accreditation, in standardized assessment processes, in products that provide comparative data like the college scorecard, in every ranking and rating system out there. Each of these are enactments of neoliberalism, as Tony Scott and Nancy Welch have recently described it. 
the belief that private interests and products associated with that interest will propel the public good. This, then, is the plot. The problem with American education is that teachers, curricula, and schools are failing. Students are not learning what they should to participate in the economy. This puts the nation at risk. How to fix it involves policy initiatives and data systems that can take this messy mass of humans, ideas, processes, and goals and instill a rational sense of order around them through what Randy Bass and Brett Einan call unbundling, separating the elements associated with demonstration of learning into discrete, disaggregated, and granular segments that can easily be packaged, delivered, and measured. This is a very different story than the one about learning reflected in our research. The title of that story, with a nod to the National Research Council, might be something like, How People Learn, Time, Location, Troublesomeness, and Embodiment. The dilemmas I'm raising here emerge from divergences between this story and the one told by the EIC. When we talk about learning, we discuss it as process and product. Learners develop abilities to identify and make conscious choices about meeting expectations for writing within specific sites, college courses, community sites, workplaces. Importantly, this development involves troublesomeness. Here, though, troublesomeness is important for learning. It leads learners to question assumptions they've made, to shake up what might have been inert, to adapt or change prior knowledge. Learning involves being comfortable with the discomfort that this invokes, because this discomfort is critical for changing one's mind. And real learning happens when that change occurs, when learners develop new or deeper ways of thinking and doing. Writing plays a critical role here. When we work with students to study writing, we are helping them look at how expectations for writing or products of writing reflect deeper commitments and epistemologies at how what is written tells us about how people work with and from expectations. All of what I've described here expands on the story about learning that runs through our research and teaching. That learning is located in specific places, develops over time, and is demonstrated through embodiment. Writing everywhere throughout this process is never just writing. It's a way of navigating contexts, negotiating identities, developing knowledge, demonstrating participation. From this perspective, we engage with students in our classes, our writing centers, our writing across the curriculum work. From this perspective, we also study the rhetoric that is used to describe learning and consider its implications for writing. And it's from this latter perspective we can see how the rhetoric used by the educational intelligence complex repeats the impulse to disaggregate and make granular to create lines that are as straight as possible from students' characteristics and prior performances through education into career. To show you what I mean, let me provide some illustration. I'll begin with excerpts from a promotional video about a predictive analytics program called Degree Compass. Tristan Denley, a mathematician who created Degree Compass, said he wanted to apply design principles to a thorny problem, how to help students intelligently find their ways through a four-year degree. Degree Compass draws on data like course enrollments, student characteristics, and degree choices to answer the question. It processes these through an algorithm to provide information to students and advisors about which courses are most appropriate, which will be most useful to advance students toward a degree, and in which they are likely to perform better. D2L, a company that acquired Degree Compass in 2013, included the video I am going to quote from in its marketing materials until recently but the video has now been removed from the site. D2L has also recently de deleted the name Degree Compass, instead referring to Learning Analytics for Education and Enterprise. Nonetheless, I've chosen to begin describing EIC's story with a few moments from the formerly prominent video because these capture the dilemma I'm describing here. I will also share with you that I and others had the opportunity to interview Denley about Degree Compass. In an hour-long discussion, he described how the system works, asserted strenuously that it was, not, it was meant to be used to provide information to people and not replace them, and discussed how to avoid unintended consequences. But the video I'm going to quote from, which features Denley discussing Degree Compass, includes none of this richness. 
Instead, it markets the product by situating it within the EI's story about the problem with American education. If you feel like multitasking while I discuss these three moments, I invite you to do an internet search for the key terms I'll mention from the video. Time is the enemy, higher education is a maze, and technology data higher education. You'll find your search returns links to EIC documents, statements, and so-called solutions that repeat the story I'm describing. In the opening of the video, Denley recaps the problem. One of the things that we really know is that when it comes to higher education, time is the enemy. The longer it takes a student to actually complete a degree program, the less likely it is that they will ever complete that degree. A second moment from the video provides a visual metaphor. Rather than higher education being sort of a nice, clean path toward a degree, for students, it's very much a maze. It then highlights how technology can address the problem. When students actually follow the advice that technology provides, we can take about a whole semester out of their educations, a whole semester of work, a whole semester of tuition, and a whole semester of not earning the salary that you would earn the job when you get the job afterward. Degree Compass really does suggest courses in which students can be much more successful with a better than 92% accuracy. The video then reflects the EIC story. The problem is the structure of higher education and technology can tackle that problem. But the video says that technology does this by straightening out what's described as a maze into a chute that moves students from college entry to work by taking classes and enrolling in majors where students like them have been previously successful. This idea of steering students to what seems to suit them and creating structures to move them through those paths quickly is also echoed in initiatives like Complete College America's Guided Pathways to Success, or GPS. Through this effort, as CCA describes it, students choose a meta-major whose goals are aligned with industry expectations, so they are workforce prepared upon graduation. To be sure, Degree Compass or GPS don't dictate the content of courses. But when these products and initiatives are encapsulated and packaged within the EIC's story, their nuances disappear. Their story also doesn't include time, location, embodiment, or encounters with troublesomeness that are central to learning in our story. Instead, these are stripped or become elements of what are represented as the problem part of what make higher education a maze that produces confusion, debt, and students' inabilities to contribute to the economy. Real learning, successful learning, looks like the straight line that will move them through from college to career. This is a much different story about learning than the one we tell, and it's one of the dilemmas we need to, real, we need to wrestle with. A second dilemma is posed by divergent visions of how students make choices about the directions they take as learners. In our story, study after study makes the point that successful learners and writers bring together their identities and the contexts where learning takes place. This synergy represents the enactment of choice and agency. But for the EIC, choice is to be guided by big data and analytics systems. In fact, predictive analytics systems are often invoked as a starting point. Guidance from these systems, their story goes, will point students in a direction that will ultimately be profitable, then reduce the time it takes them to earn a degree or credential that they will use to get to this profitable moment. The differences between the roles of choice and agency in these two stories can be quite stark. In the end, predictive analytics systems are sophisticated sorting mechanisms. Researchher's Solon Barakas and Andrew Selbs to explain that the purpose of such systems is to provide a rational basis to distinguish between individuals and to reliably confer to the individual the qualities possessed by those who seem statistically similar. The conferring of these qualities occurs through the algorithmic processing of quantitative data by machines. But the research on learning and writing provides abundant evidence of learning that is very difficult to quantify and perhaps even more difficult to incorporate into an algorithm that would be sensitive to time, location, and embodiment. Informatics researcher Simon Buckingham Shum makes the point beautifully. Data points on a graph are tiny portals onto a rich human world, but they do not do justice to the complexity of real people 
and the rich forms that learning takes. There are other problems with the, associated with the way these data are used in predictive systems too. The predictions generated by software are correlational, not causal. This slide from a site I highly recommend called Spurious Correlations illustrates the problem. Yes, there is a very strong correlation between per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who have died from being strangled in their bedsheets. But it's hardly going to lead any of us to make decisions about cheese consumption for our personal sleeping safety. <laughs> However, if a low-income student from a high school in California's Central Valley decides she wants to be a physics major, the correlations there aren't likely to look good. When predictive analytics are done crudely, when the data is bad, when the algorithms are incorrect, or when they fail to take into account consequences, it would be, as would be the case if the student were told that physics probably wasn't going to be right for her, results can be enormously problematic. Barakas and Selbst make the point eloquently. It's possible for the recommendations that emerge from predictive analytics systems to be simultaneously rational and unfair. Rational because they are statistically sound and seem neutral, unfair because they perpetuate inequalities and make certain individuals actuarially saddled by statistically sound inferences that are nonetheless inaccurate. This is why data scientist Kathy O'Neill refers to these systems as weapons of math destruction. Many of these models, she writes, encode human prejudice, misunderstanding, and bias into the software systems that increasingly manage our lives. Ideas about data-guided choice embedded in the EIC's story about the problem with American education and how to fix it then are quite different than the ones that run through our research, teaching and thinking about learning and writing. A final aspect of the dilemma opened by these divergent stories about what learning means told by the EIC and in the, our own research concerns whose expertise is most valued. Even if the prediction or the data provided via an analytics system is a recommendation to a human, it may be, as Ben Williamson says, designed according to the values and assumptions about learning and pedagogy held by technical experts. IBM Watson's Enlight is an illustration of this possibility. IBM says that Enlight provides teachers with, quote, a comprehensive review of relevant data to understand each student's strengths and areas of growth. It gives teachers curated, personalized learning content and activities aligned with each student's needs. The combination of data analysis and technologies in Enlight, says IBM, will provide teachers with a comprehensive understanding of their class from a single source. Actionable insights provided on demand and materials for teachers to craft targeted learning experiences on the fly from the Watson Education Library. Since Watson will provide the curriculum, the teacher role changes to a higher value plane with less focus on lesson creation and an increasing focus on facilitating. Tasks considered of value today will change in terms of how we come to perceive value over time. And this includes tasks associated with writing. In the future, systems will be capable of analyzing essay style answers, which will permit teachers to spend more time on higher value activities. It's just writing after all, so it can be dealt with by non-humans. To be sure, there are users of data and analytics systems who have taken into account many of the possibilities I'm outlining here. I'll discuss some shortly. But here, I want to make the point that separate from their use, the rhetoric of these analytics application often perpetuates the EIC's story of the problem with American education and how to fix it. This story and the materials associated with it sometimes run very counter to the definitions of learning suffusing our thinking and our practice. As they seek to make granular learning, the choices students make, and the work of teaching, they also disassemble the rich and meaty ways in which writing is never just writing. It's in the face of dilemmas like these that perpetuate the EIC story that we need to consider how to advocate, starting with the idea that writing is never just writing. This advocacy matters for our professional lives, our colleagues, our institutions. Because if writing is not understood as a powerful tool, a strategy, a representation of ideas, a vehicle for action and change, if it is seen as just writing, then the ability to approach writing as a subject of study, as something that must be understood and used within contexts 
over time, for purposes, will fall away. That will make it harder for those people we work with most, students, to act as agents, whether they're navigating post-secondary education or a political climate that seems like it's going to require some tricky moves. The question then is how to advocate, and that's what I'll talk about next. Successful advocacy means working towards strategies, long-term goals, through particular tactics. Developing these strategies and tactics takes discipline, and that's the first thing we need to work on. The Taking Action workshops at 4Cs 2016 introduced a framework for developing strategies and tactics, and Carolyn's theme of cultivating capacity does this too. We're also developing resources for taking action with the 4Cs Executive Committee this year. NCTE has a resource for action-taking strategies called Everyday Action, and I'll list the URL for that slide, as well as other resources you can look to for developing strategies for action-taking on this slide. And I'll post all these, so don't worry about writing them down. As these sources will tell you, all advocacy extends from principle. Our principles are reflected in our disciplinary identity. And here's the first takeaway from today's presentation. Through this identity, we can make a difference in the face of these dilemmas and others that pose challenges to our roles and to the students we teach. Through this identity, we can convey understanding why, understand why writing is never just writing is so important for so many. When I invoke our disciplinary identity, I'm referring to three parts that come together in our fundamental commitments as writing professionals. Each fills in the dimension of the idea that writing is never just writing. The first of these three parts is an interest in the insides of things. In our teaching and our research, we look at how writing works, how writers go about the activities of writing, the roles writing plays for people in situations. For instance, we look at how writers understand assignments or how they go about producing text or how they use writing to motivate change. We teach students to study writing in specific places, then practice with conventions associated with what they see. This interest in the insides and how writing works and what it does helps us to describe to ourselves and others that writing is never just writing. The second part of our disciplinary identity is constituted from our expert knowledge. Participating in this knowledge leads us to particular ways of looking at the things we are interested in, to particular ways of interpreting what we learn as we examine those things to ways of describing what we know. When I talk about these things we know, I refer to them as threshold concepts. This term refers to fundamental concepts that participants in disciplines see through and see with. Some of the threshold concepts of our discipline are on this slide. Within our discipline, others have also used other ways to condense and explain our expert knowledge, like keywords. Here, I'll point to work both by Paul Heilker and Peter Vandenberg, and a new collection by Iris Ruiz and Raul Sanchez. All of these efforts pull together the field's expert knowledge into accessible terms. Our expert knowledge, reflected in threshold concepts or keywords, helps us to understand and convey how writing is never just writing. They help us say things like this. Writing is social and rhetorical. Qualities of good writing are shaped by people with purposes in specific places. Writers must recognize that to produce what's considered good writing requires the ability to analyze expectations in specific locations. To do this, writers must approach writing as a subject of study and an activity. Through study, they identify expectations. They engage in activity that involves making choices about content and form. But these choices aren't neutral. The writing that writers create ultimately reflects their analysis of choices and expectations. Their writing, then, is never just writing. It's a complex activity through which they've made their ways. The third part of our disciplinary identity is a sense of responsibility for writers, writing, conditions for writing, and consequences. When I invoke responsibility, I look to Tara Fenwick. For her, responsibility is a set of actions that emerge from and are attuned to possibilities available within specific socio-material conditions say, those associated with the EIC story of learning and its implications for writing. To engage in responsible action, we must be sensitive to the diversity of people and ideas circulating in conditions, open to possibilities for collaboration, and willing to develop principled connections between our interests 
our expert knowledge and diverse people and ideas. When we collaborate with diverse people and ideas and develop principled connections, we are engaging in what Fenwick calls knowing in practice around the idea that writing is never just writing. This latter point is especially important. Writing, after all, doesn't belong to us. It truly is everybody's business. Deb Brandt eloquently reminds us that writing has always been less for good than it is a good. She also shows us how we understand this good, this business, in ways that others do not. Our sense of responsibility and our knowing and practice helps us understand why the idea that writing is never just writing is so important. Our advocacy must start from this disciplinary identity. Then we need to le learn more about where we want to advocate, about the ideas and principles held by people in those sites. In this talk, I've focused on the educational intelligence complex. I've honed in on the story that it tells about American education and the rhetoric it uses to tell this story, since I think this story suffuses discussions about writing and learning at all levels. It's reflected, for instance, in the comment, my students can't write. To learn more about the EIC's story and the policies and practices that extend from it, I tend to start with sources like these, which take me to hundreds more. But you might want to focus your advocacy work in a different place, a department, a writing program, an institution. The important thing is to learn about the values and principles that drive that place and shape its stories, no matter what the place is. Then we need to consider what issues we want to address and how they are associated with those values. I've used data analytics as one of my focus issues here. That might not be the issue you want to attend to, and again, that's fine. If you do want to start digging into data analytics, here are some of the sources that have helped me. But back to advocacy. Once we've identified a location, learned about the values and principles of that location, and identified an issue, we can start putting this into motion. This means starting from our disciplinary identity, our interest in the insides, our knowledge, and our knowing and practice. Optimistically, it means trying, if possible, to make connections between our values and principles and those held by others. From here, we can introduce the concept that writing is never just writing and explore why it matters to writers, for writing, and the roles that writing plays. Of course, we also need to work from our disciplinary identity to fact check, too, to ensure that assertions being made about students writing or writing classes are based in evidence and not what an official associated with the current administration called alternate facts. What I describe here, <laughs> especially trying to build connections with those whose stories and values seem so different from our own, might seem risky. But to not make this attempt, to connect only with those who share our ideas and ideologies replicates the same issues with predictive analytics I described earlier. It leads us back to ourselves, creating the filter bubble we heard so much about after the recent election. Additionally, it's from this risky place, those attempts to put our knowledge into practice with others, where we can most effectively advocate. Again, I've focused on big picture EIC issues and stories here, but this work can be located anywhere. This is something all of us can do. And this is another important takeaway. No matter what our position in the field, when we make alliances through our disciplinary identity to advocate, we can make a difference. Let me point to just a few illustrations of what I mean. Faculty at Arizona's Mesa Community College learned that their administration had opted into Guided Pathways for Success, the effort I described earlier. The college emphasized knowledge, skills, and habits of mind. But when Alex Edegin, Mesa's WPA, started to meet with the team's building guided pathways, he found they were only focusing on knowledge and skills, and their definitions of those two things were driven by the needs of industry and transfer institutions. Alex brought the discussion back to ha habits of mind, drawing on threshold concepts of writing and the framework for success in post-secondary writing to make connections between what faculty were thinking and our expert knowledge. He calls this a process of translation, asking, how do I package what I'm saying so that you're hearing it within the language of GPS, but it also represents what we know? Here, Alex and his colleague work from our disciplinary knowledge to help others define what they meant by habits of mind, drawing both on external sources like employer feedback and their own understandings. This kind of effort 
brings our knowledge and theirs into productive discussions about pathways. Post-secondary writing faculty in Idaho have worked together to create the Write Class, a predictive analytics system for writing placement. But this platform reflects our expert disciplinary knowledge about writing success and placement. When they use the system, students reflect on actual course descriptions and self-assess their histories and confidence with writing. They can look at information about the courses and on what factors are used in the process of making the placement. The base algorithm was created by writing faculty and is regularly reassessed. The write class is also customized for each campus based on that campus's population. Each campus also decides how to use it for a required placement or guided self-placement. And it builds reflection into students' use of the software, incorporating questions about what they are doing as they think through their writing and reading practices. This also brings our disciplinary knowledge and the solutions proposed by the EIC, like the use of data analytics, into productive conversation. Beyond writing courses, University of Michigan physics professor Tim McKay, thinking about how to leverage data analytics to address issues with achievement gaps in his courses, has developed a tailored coaching system called eCoach that uses predictive, quantitative, and qualitative data to develop coaching prompts customized to characteristics that correlate with learning achievement. We're in the process of adapting eCoach at UC Santa Barbara for a biology course. Rather than promote it as a system, though, McKay understands that eCoach is a framework that must be adapted locally. The coaching prompts are developed through extensive interviews with students and faculty in the courses where the software is to be used, on the campus where it is to be used. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution or set of language practices. The course, the student, the characteristics correlated with learning are flexible pieces that change in different contexts and are changeable within the system. This is the same flexibility that's built into products like Eli Review, which provides an analytics-driven framework for peer review that writing instructors and students can customize together. These brief descriptions don't do justice to the richness of any of these projects, and I have not included many of the other efforts within and beyond our field that bring together our disciplinary identity with processes also used by the EIC. However, they all illustrate how it's possible to do tremendous work with the elements currently associated with that story. This reflects our disciplinary identity and the idea at its core that writing is never just writing, but is instead a way of exploring, of representing learning, of participating in ideas and ideologies. So, yes, it's often true that writing is less for good than it is a good. But understanding how it is a good, what it is presumed to do for people in circumstances, how people are taught and learn to interact with those ways and how those ways are assessed is also a good. It's our disciplinary identity that combination of an interest in the insides, of expert knowledge and knowing in practice that allows us to do work for good with and through writing. This is what we bring, the unique contribution that we can make as writing professionals. Through our identity, we can engage dilemmas, advocate for our beliefs, and make a difference. The sites of application, these places where we can make our work matter are going to look different depending on where and who we are, the status that we hold, our strengths as people and as professionals. But across all of these sites of application, there is that shared focus on these things, writing, writers, and writing practices that we care about and we know make such a difference. Because writing is never just writing. And across all these sites, we can help ensure that this thing, writing, is constructed for good and with good in mind for its producers, for those who teach it, and for the contexts in which it circulates. That is the challenge that lies ahead of the four C's and as four C's members of all of us. We can meet it. Let's get going. <laughs>